lots of folks. So I'm Al Fisher, I'm one of the geriatrics doctors here, and I'm going to talk about the older driver today, which um, the topic I have to say I didn't know very much about until we had our C annual CME course, and all of a sudden I got this letter from uh, Sandra Sanchez Riley thanking me for uh, agreeing to give this talk. So I uh, had an opportunity last summer to like look, to review this topic and learn about it, but you know it, it also kind of emphasizes that if you kind of Sometimes you can take advantage of those as an opportunity to learn about something that I can't say I was very knowledgeable about. I feel much more confident about this topic in, in the clinic now. Um, I've taken a, a slightly different approach to, to discussing this topic, which you can feel to see and uh, you can let me know if you think it's helpful or not. So the learning objectives that Sandra assigned to me were to discuss the unique features of the older driver and how this affects their safety. Um, to describe a stepwise process and how to assess the older driver, and then finally to how to address issues related to independent safety and quality of life on the older driver, especially ones who you know were worried about their ability to continue being a, a safe older driver. So why is this topic important? And really, I think it's one that just like every geriatric talk, you know, doesn't really need a ton of explanation, which is that you know the the old population of older people is rapidly increasing. Um, and then importantly is the drivers over the age of 75 have an accident rate that's second only to new drivers. So, that, so the problem is not only is this group growing, but also this group becomes you know, the two groups that we think about for dangerous driving, unfortunately. Teenagers have just got their license, and then, um, and then the older driver. Um, additionally, auto accidents end up being the leading cause of accidental death in people who are 65 to 74. The good news is this has decreased largely due to things like seatbelt laws, airbags, improvements in car technology, but it's still, you know, this is a preventable cause of mortality. And then I think probably the key for any of us who have older relatives who are drivers, or for me when I'm in the clinic, is no one really wants to be that person that, that you know, has their family member or patient or whatever be that older driver that you always see in the newspaper story where they plowed into a festival or something else where they confuse the gas and the brake. So on one hand, if you think about you know, the, the crash rate, the fatal crash rate for drivers, and this runs all the way from people who just got their license to you know, being over age of 85, you might look at this graph and say, well, you know, you know, it's really just the 20 to 24 year olds that are the big problem. And actually people who are 85 are like the safest drivers out there. And so you'd say, well, why are you giving this talk? Well, it turns out that if you, if, so the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration did a little survey, and little is literally where they got like less than 50 people, and they brought them in, and they asked them, have you made any changes? And these are older drivers, and they said, have you made any changes to your driving to try to avoid having an accident? And they broke it out as to people that have not had an accident, people that have. And I think the thing I take away from this is really look at the number of changes that people have made to their driving behaviors compared to when they were younger, really with the express goal of trying to avoid having an accident. And they've done things like they make fewer trips, they do drive fewer miles, they don't drive at night, they don't drive in bad weather, rush hour, you know, they, they follow farther behind other vehicles, they avoid roads that have a lot of traffic. So a lot of the things you would say, boy, you know, if we really were trying to come up with strategies to avoid having an accident, those are probably good ideas. You know, drive when there's fewer cars, drive when the, there's not going to be an environmental thing that's driving an accident, and, and uh, avoid things like freeways, and avoiding left turns, other things like that. And so when we factor in the fact that we've made all these ad adaptations, then all of a sudden we see the accident problem shot pop up at that point. So what they did in this graph is they basically have we have our age on the x-axis again, and this is the crashes and fatal crashes, and it now it's per the million or hundred million miles you drive. And so when you normalize it based on how much driving you do, again we see this young group, you know, being again kind of the folks that get into the accidents, and then it kind of drops down, and probably most of us are someplace in this ballpark, and then when you get out to being uh, in the 80 and and above group, then all of a sudden it shoots up again and you end up being pretty close to those younger folks. 
Importantly, the fatal accidents really pop up at this point, and probably part of this is now you have kind of the older person that's in the car, and so the accident that won't kill off the, the 16 to 19 year old and will kill off the 85 year old. Now you could say maybe the, these older folks are just being, being the patsies for the bad driving for all the other people that are out there on the road. That you know, that you know, you get in a crash and then like it's kind of like um, in football when like you know they all kind of point at you know somebody jumps offside. You know the defense points at the offense. Oh, it's clearly you know false start. The offense points at the defense. Oh, it's clearly offside. And the referees have to figure out who it, who really was at fault. Maybe what's happening is it's just that that you know older people get in an accident and younger people just go oh well you know if I tell the cop that the older guy caused the driver caused the accident no one's going to contest that and I can avoid getting getting my insurance rate jacked up or getting points or something. Well, so what they did is they went to so the NTSA went and looked at accidents and by uh, looking through them in detail, figuring out who was involved. And then what they did is they calculated something called the crash involvement ratio, which what this is is the number of at-fault accidents you have divided by your not-at-fault accidents. And so when we, and so when you do it that way, we can see our younger driver again, they're twice as likely to be involved in an accident when it's their fault. So if they get in a crash, it's going to be the 16 and 9 year old that did it. Um, and then when we get out here to the 80 plus, again, we're looking at again being the older driver's fault and actually you know most of us are kind of in this ballpark and, you know when we get in a crash it's usually the other guy that did it so it's these guys and these guys or you know the angry guys with big trucks that run into you or something so i kind of was interested in trying to find out when do older drivers really get into crashes like is are there certain things that they do or certain circumstances that that lead to the crashes and NTSA, like, fortunately, I had the same question. They actually went through and looked to see when do older drivers get into crashes. And it turns out that these five places are where most of their accidents occur. And so, when, so the first one is that left turn and intersection with stop sign control for the driver's approach and the cross traffic does not stop. AKA, if you go out to like Fredericksburg, for example, there are places where you have a, you come up, you get a stop sign, and Fredericksburg is just whizzing by on both sides of the road. And so you're trying to make a left-hand turn onto Fredericksburg going across two lanes of traffic, and they don't stop for anything. So that's, num that's their number one place where they get into accidents. Um, next one's a left turn in an intersection with a traffic light. Um, the next one is a right turn in an intersection controlled by a yield sign into a channelized right turn lane especially when merging onto a principal artery that has speeds of 40 to 45 miles per hour. So it, when kind of what this is, is on uh, words back at like Floyd Curl, for example, there's those little, uh, they have a little island and then there's a little lane that kind of goes off to make the right hand turn with a yield sign in. So those are the, the culprits that people get into. There's also a medical in words back, um, like right in front of the, or is it not C, it's a Walgreens or CBS. There's like the Wendy's and the CBS, and they have little channelized things with yield signs there, and those end up being the other place they get the crashes. Um, also, when they merge from a yield sign onto a limited access highway, so that's kind of like you pull down the freeway ramp, and all of a sudden there's a yield sign down there, and you get to yield and try to find a, a, a window to get onto the freeway. There used to be some of this in Pittsburgh, which was one of my favorite activities. Was, or right, let's yield and wait for those 18 wheel trucks to go by. Um, and then the last one is the lane change on the multi-lane highway, aka on the freeway. So what unites these driving activities? And this is our audience participation part of it. So our, our lecture. So things that these have in common. Anticipatory um, actions based on the other drivers. Okay. You know, so I guess kind of. So you have to be able to kind of read traffic and kind of divine out what other drivers might be thinking of doing, especially like the lane change, for example. Because mm -hmm. you have to kind of like look over and go, gee, is that guy in that in the lane that's two over from me? 
looking to come over as well. And, okay. and similarly, like the left turn turn, you have to kind of divide out how fast the other cars are going and if they're going to speed up or slow down or whatever. Okay. Other things? I think maybe quick reflexes to do all those when you pass. Okay. Right. I think, yeah, the, you, especially like this guy, for example, you kind of come around, you never really know what you're going to find until you get there, and you got to either quickly you know, go, oh man, there's a car coming to slam on the brakes, or see that's open and like slam on the gas at that point. Or, you know, similarly with this, you got to like kind of figure out where your window is and be able to quickly make a, a, a choice to, to go or not go at that point. Okay. And along with that is utilizing some of your peripheral. Ah, yes. So you can kind of have a field of vision. Yeah. Because some of these, I, I get on these and I'm like, who thought this was a good idea? Um, you know, you, you kind of come around the corner, and then it's like, you're, you're here, and the traffic is coming from back there. And so you're like kind of sitting there like this, trying to like look to see when that open window is. Yeah, there are a couple of these like in the neighborhood I live in here, and I'm like, who thought this was a good idea to put these in? Where you just find, like it just, they kind of just give me the willies because you're trying to figure out if there's somebody sneaking up behind you. Okay. All right, well, let's move on. To, so these are the things that I came up with, which is these are all basically complex and, and difficult driving tasks, meaning that if you're taking your 16-year-old son or daughter out for, you know, their, for their Sunday driving practice, these are not the things that you're going to be like taking them out to do. This is usually the kind of stuff that they would be doing when they're getting closer to taking the test, or even like you know if you keep practicing with them after they take the test and get their license to become better drivers. Um, and some of these might be things that, that you know if we're picking a route, we might actually avoid doing. Like, are, like is this anybody's favorite activity to do when they're driving? No, it's like if you ever see me in, at an intersection like this. You know that I either made a mistake and went down the wrong road, or I don't know the area very well. Because I will intentionally take other routes to avoid having to do this. So I basically figure out which streets will connect up with Fredericksburg where I have a stoplight so I don't have to deal with this. Um, Additionally, these things involve things like estimating the speed of other cars and the time available. So all the yields, for example, you've got to figure out, is that car going 25, is that car going 50, because you've got a different window. So when you're making that left turn, you know, if that car is going 25 or 50, you're going to have a different amount of time to make your turn. Um, they also all require multitasking, so meaning that you're steering the car, because you're making a turn or moving onto the roadway, but at the same time, you're also managing your speed and also watching other cars at the same time. So these are you know, things that you have to divide into attention. As somebody mentioned, you need to be able to see that the sides are behind your car. And then, as you mentioned, these often require split-second decisions and strategy changes based upon evolving traffic uh, patterns. So if we think about these activities, maybe we could come up with what it takes to be a good driver, and we can then use that as a way of thinking about our old driver and whether um, they're, whether they're still safe or not. So the thing we need is we need to have good vision because we have to be able to see the other cars. We need to have enough visual spatial ability to be able to estimate their speeds. We need to know all of our car controls. So if we have some, some cognitive impairment, we're having trouble gassing the brake, where's that turn signal, those types of things might be not such a good, a good plan. We need to have the knowledge of the rules of the road and we know that even among um, non-older drivers, the kind of knowledge of the rules of the road deteriorate the time. Like who's supposed to yield, who's got, who's got the right of way, becomes kind of something that people are not always completely knowledgeable about. You need to have flexibility. Be able to see behind your car and your blind spots. You need to be able to pay attention. So you can't. You have to be able to resist internal and external distractors. You need to have decisiveness, quick reflexes, a lack of distractions. You need to have some level. Of really so then you can kind of hear horns, ambulances, those types of things. So let's do a couple of cases and we'll, we'll kind of explore some of these issues. 
So case number one, we have an 85 year old man with coronary disease, congestive heart failure, knee up at 35%, osteoarthritis, macular degeneration, and asked during a routine follow up visit, should I stop driving? So the cruel question we're going to answer is what are the age related changes that make an older driver differ from a younger driver? And are there social or medical factors that we need to consider? So the age related changes that affect driving, I think probably one of the biggest ones is vision. And the things that happen is we have decreases in the near vision, aka presbyopia, which in a driving context isn't necessarily going to be a big factor because you know you, it, the main thing would be your speedometer, the only close up thing, and usually that type of bomb on that is pretty big. Um, but I think the more important things are is we need better illumination and contrast for vision. So I, like I find February here is a very difficult month to drive because the sun in the morning and the evening is at kind of a low level in the, in the sky and it can be really difficult to make lane changes because it's hard to see what's going on in that lane to your left or right, for example. And I find sometimes I even like, well, time my lane changes to like when I go past a building and it blocks the sun for like 20 seconds so I can then go, okay, there's nobody there and make my lane change at that point. Um, they have increased difficulty with glare, and then, and then additionally, there's an increased incidence of cataract, glaucoma, and macular degeneration. And well, I have pictures of kind of what these do to your vision in a couple of slides. Um, for hearing, there's high frequency hearing loss. Uh, in the nervous system, there are changes in your reaction time. There's an increased incidence of neuropathy due to diseases like uh, diabetes, for example. And then there's also an increased incidence of dementia, Parkinson's disease, and stroke, which are neurodegenerative or vascular diseases that can impair our ability to stay, drive safely. In the musculoskeletal system, there's a reduced range of motion in the neck and the back. There's a reduced range of motion in the shoulders, which kind of make it difficult to look at behind and in those blind spots. And then in the cardiopulmonary system, there is an increased incidence of coronary disease, congestive heart failure, and COPD. And these are potential diseases that might impair our ability to drive safely. So, what are the effects of eye diseases on vision? And I have to say, I didn't really, you know, even after going through medical school, I didn't really understand very much how these diseases impact on vision. And really, when I was a geriatric fellow, I started to appreciate this more and more. Um, and so, this is what normal vision looks like, and this is stuff I got off the National Eye Institute website. And so, glaucoma. It's going to give you a picture like this. So you can see where you've basically lost the peripheral fields of vision. And so you can imagine if you're trying to make a left hand turn, for example, and you've got four lanes of traffic um, that you're trying to watch all at the same time to decide if you can safely make a left turn, this is going to be a big problem because you might be able to see one lane, and now three of the lanes are basically off in this dark spot. And you know, so you start making your turn, and oh dang it, they're surprised. A car pulled out from a fast food restaurant and is now in that outside lane that you didn't see before. Um, this is also another big one, an age-related macular degeneration, where now all of a sudden you've basically lost the center of your field of vision, and now you're struggling to try to drive using these peripheral parts of our vision, which don't really have the same detail and focus that the center part does. And so you can imagine here, you know, you're trying to make a left-hand turn, and okay, you can be sure these lanes are empty and this lane's empty, but what about here? I don't, I don't know if there's a car there. Um, or if you're driving down the middle of the street, you know, is there a dog or a bike rider or some or pedestrian that's right in front of you? Really hard to say with that problem. And this is what cataract looks like. We basically just have this generalized blurriness of your visual field, and you can just see where, again, this is going to make it really hard to figure out, is that a car, is that a dog, is that a person, some of the fine details, especially trying to estimate movement speeds can be really difficult if your vision looks like this. So are there social and medical factors we should be thinking about? And this is data from NTSA, and this was kind of back, and this is data that's almost 20 years old now, but what they tried to do is do a little multivariate analysis to see are there um, social factors or medical factors that may predict crash, crashes in either men or women. And I think while this data is a little dated, I think it's still useful for us to kind of think a little bit about this. Um, and so for men, kind of not surprisingly, greater number of miles driven is going to be 
related to a crash risk. Um, living alone, which probably means you drive for miles and so you're likely to get in a crash. Um, interestingly, back pain for some reason uh, shows up as a risk factor, both for men and for women. Maybe what this is is if your back's hurting, you don't really want to, you, you kind of get lazy about checking those blind spots or checking behind you. And as a result, you're more likely to get into those side accidents on the Portland Highway. Um, being employed, uh, which again probably gets back to greater numbers of miles driven, uh, history of glaucoma, having a low word score on a word recall test, so maybe it's suggesting that the cognition may play a role in this. And then this was in the era before SSRIs, and so antidepressant use was associated with this, and this could be that because these were TCAs and maybe syncope or other things associated with those. Um, for women, if you have greater number of miles driven again, living alone and back pain being the main risk factors. At the same time, this isn't really that helpful for us trying to determine if our patient's safe or not, because you know, well, gee, okay, I can't really <coughs> my patient a little more drive anymore. Um, whereas, you know, that's, I think it's more of those just to be kind of con sensitive to the fact that people may drive differently based upon their social circumstances. So, are there specific medical conditions that are contraindications to drive? And this is, uh, there's a, a great resource on the, uh, on the Texas Department of Public Safety website, um, which is, uh, so this is a, a PDF that's like 100 pages long that's put out by the Texas Medical Advisory Board. And we'll talk a little bit more about the Texas Medical Advisory Board and their role in driver's license decisions. Um, but this, this resource is really, is excellent. So it's one where you know I definitely would recommend like Googling it and having it or at least know where it is. And not necessarily because you want to like memorize all of these, but if you have a patient that kind of what about that, they've actually gone through remarkable detail and evaluated just about any disease you can think of and come up with you know guidelines for whether this person could be a safe driver or not, and what, what you need to be a safe driver. But this is just kind of a list I pulled out of this, and it's not even scratching the surface really. But, you know, so, so these are the things that are contraindications to driving. And so there are things like syncope, and with the caveat that you're symptom free, you can drive again. Um, things like having an, uh, th class three or four angina or CH CHF, the thought being is that you might be driving along and either be symptomatic at rest, or like with kind of minimal, you know, getting agitated and the driver gets symptomatic at that point. And now all of a sudden you've got like an internal distraction that you know, you're not so focused on driving safely anymore because you're having chest pain at that point. Um, things like tachyarrhythmias or heart blocks, not surprisingly, um, seizures, um, a stroke with a deficit. And here kind of, you know, the issue with that is there's deficit and there's deficit. And so the thought there is that you really need to have a driving test to figure out is your deficit really going to cause a problem or not. Um, things like recurrent TIAs, a head injury, deficits. And then this is one we'll spend a little bit more time on here, um, dementia, uh, with a CDR score greater than one. Um, and then we've got Parkinson's disease, sleep apnea if it's not treated, I guess you, know, you fall asleep while you're driving, uh, psychosis, PTSD, uh, diabetes, if you're having symptomatic hyper hyperglycemia, and then your vision requirements are less than 27 in the better eye, or a visual field is less than 140 degrees. So, what is the clinical the clinical dementia rating scale? And this is something I, I have to say I didn't really think much about this until I started putting this talk together, and it's actually kind of useful because the I think it's pretty common in geriatrics that we have people where yeah, you know, are they super demented? No. Are they not exact? Do they got some level of cognitive impairment? Yeah. And then the question is like, well, how demented can you be and still be able to drive? And this, I think this is kind of one of these things where, you know, kind of this list, these are a little easier and cut and dry, where it's like, well, you got heart block, you just need a face maker, and we'll kind of take care of two things at once. Whereas here the problem is, is like, well, I have a good number of patients that are kind of in this slippery slope between safe and unsafe. And, you know, is there a way I can learn a little bit about that? And the CDR ends up basically uh, helping us with this. So this is what the CDR looks like. And so zero is good, um, three is severe in terms of, being, in terms of 
the score and then also the level of impairment. And so it then breaks into the different domains of like memory, orientation, judgment or problem solving, community affairs, and then home and hobbies. And so if we're thinking about the one, so it's basically if you get to one, you're kind of at that cutoff where now we're starting to think about it. Meaning that if you're on this side of it, it's probably okay for you to drive. If you're on this side, definitely not. Um, and the way you score this is that it's it's essentially you focus on the memory score unless three other domains are much better or much worse than that one. So in that case, that means we're really going to be focusing on this one here. So what this is is described as moderate memory loss, more marked for recent events, and importantly, the defect interferes with their everyday activities. So this is one where if you kind of talk to the patient or even observe them in the office, for example, you know that they have memory impairment, and it seems to be impacting their ability to function, meaning like, you know, they haven't refilled medicines in months, they forget medical appointments, they, the daughter's mad at them because they forgot to go to the grandson's graduation, those types of things. That's telling us that, okay, our patient's probably here, and it's probably at that point where we're gonna need to, to start thinking about curtailing the driving activities. And if they're really beyond that, meaning that now, um, they have a severe memory loss, meaning that now it's really impossible for them to learn new things, then they're definitely at the point where we need to, to, to have the discussion with them about their ability to drive safely. You know, this is one where um, I haven't really memorized this, but I kind of keep this in my mind as some of the things I'm looking for, and if people are starting to cross from uh, into this column, and then importantly starting to cross in this column to that column, then I'm really starting to say, I don't think this person's safe at this point. So my last patient today was somebody who um, is kind of starting to have features over here, and so we had to spend some time uh, before I came up here talking a little bit about this um, in terms of his curtailing his driving activities. So let's look at case number two. So this is an 80-year-old woman that has osteoarthritis, mild diabetes, hypothyroid and COPD and glaucoma, uh, returns for a routine follow-up visit. Daughter pulls you aside during the visit, which is kind of everyone's favorite thing, and says, you know, I don't know if mom's able to drive safely anymore, kind of like, well, tag, you're it, um, and making it your responsibility. So now the questions are, from, from our perspective, are, are there warning signs that suggest an older driver may be impaired, meaning that you know it's more than just kind of the daughter being a little anxious about her mom, that there really are warning signs out there. And then who can and must report a patient impaired driver to Texas? And this is something that varies from state to state in terms of what um, somebody as a licensed professional needs to do. And so we'll talk about what the expectations are here in Texas. So warning signs for the impaired driver. So the interesting thing, if you go to the Cochrane database and say, okay, is there a scoring scheme or other prognostic index I can get out there? Is there a CHADS 2 for driving, for example? It turns out there isn't. So interestingly, when they say, despite the numbers of older drivers and, in, and the individual population safety concerns, little data exists for systematic screening tests apart from the vision test. Um, and then, but then they also conclude that evidence for driving difficulty can often be obtained from the patient, patient's partner or spouse, or patient's family by careful questioning. So does anybody have ideas to what kind of questions you want to ask? So I've come across a four item screener for this called uh, the four C's, and I can't always remember it, I always have to go back. It's like crash, um, family concern, um, I always blank. Um, one of them is medical condition. Okay. But, yeah. Right. So, okay. So, kind of like, you know, are there family concerns? So, maybe that daughter was, you know, actually on the right track and listening to her it was the right thing to do. Okay. And then, have they had any accidents with the thought being, well, if they're having accidents, it's probably not a good sign. Have they gotten lost? Okay. They got lost. The thought being is that they have some cognitive impairment that would kind of tell tell us they're going from one to two, for example, okay? Do you let your children ride with them? Ah, oh, that's a good one. Somebody's in my talk before. Right? <laughs> Do you feel safe with <laughs> Right, so let's, let's move on to our next one then. So the, so the things to ask about are, 
you know, as you mentioned, accidents, near misses, unexplained damage to the vehicle or objects in the driveway, like the mailbox. And this is one where I've actually had families come in and say, like, you know, the mailbox got damaged. And so then it's kind of like you have to start deciding, was it like uh, neighbor kids that want to play mailbox baseball, or was it you know, mom or dad that was the culprit for that one? Um, you can ask the patient, do they feel fearful during driving? You know, if they're feeling anxious, maybe they're actually reading and uh, reading things um, correctly and, under and appreciating that their ability to drive safely is kind of impaired. Um, do they feel frustrated, confused, or probably the most ominous one is needing more compassion for while driving, which is kind of, you know, one where you're kind of like, all right, I think we've got a diagnosis. Um, do they do things like drive too fast or too slow? Do they stop unexpectedly? Um, and when I was a teenager, I got a ride home from uh, uh, this golf pro I was taking lessons from, and boy, that was the most terrifying 15 minutes of my life, where he would drive intermittently too fast and too slow and then stop unexpectedly at every single intersection. And I know now that like Benny really needed to get reported to the DMV. Um, but, and it's taking away that, if, that you know, experience is kind of the things they'll be looking for. Do they have difficulty seeing or obeying road signs? So I had one patient that um, lost his license when he stopped in the middle of the freeway to read the exit sign. Um, he just, oh my it was just too hard to, he, he needed a little more time than, than freeway speed was providing, and so he decided to stop, and um, the police officers kind of appropriately uh, mm -hmm. triaged him onto evaluation. Um, and then getting lost, as Valerie had mentioned. And then I really find the key questions to be, um, so of the patient is, do you have friends that refuse to ride in the car with you? You know, <laughs> is if your friends are refusing to be in the car with you, that's a pretty good sign. It's just that they, they don't care if they're gonna fend you anymore because they want to save their own life. <laughs> so that means they feel, feel like that's, that's probably not a good good thing for you to do. And then I think for, um, the, the kids, for example, the two ones are, do you feel safe when they're driving? And I think the most, the clearest one is, you know, would you let your kids ride in the car? Because if people won't let their kids ride with mom, mom or dad anymore, it's like we've kind of, we've voted at that point in terms of whether this person's safe or not. So, if we do have people we have concerns about based on these questions, who has to report these folks to, to the Department of Public Safety in Texas? Now this is one that if you're a physician, nurse, physician's assistant, dentist, you know, it, it, you need to be attentive to what state you're in. So in the state of California, if you have concerns about the person's driving ability, you have to report them to the California DMV. And there, there's actually a little form, and I spend many a, many a Thursday afternoon in San Francisco faxing stuff off to the DMV, and, um, and then uh, have angry calls the next Monday waiting for me at that point. Um, in Texas, interestingly, physicians are not mandated to report potential limitations. And similarly, dentists, nurses, um, physician assistants are similarly in, a, in the same ballpark. So we're not actually mandated. So if we see somebody and we go, I don't know if they're going really to drive it safe or not, we're not going to get legal trouble for not reporting that. And interestingly, the VA, for those of you that were at the, uh, at the staff meeting a couple of weeks ago, there was actually, a, they, they gave us a big handout, but they didn't discuss it, but one of the things was that if you're a physician in the VA, you're actually not allowed to contact the DMV um, anymore to report to people that you have concerns about. So it's kind of, kind of an interesting thing. I guess they're worried about like patient confidentiality and disclosures of personal health information. It, it kind of came across as a little like, a little cold, I guess, you know, in terms of, well, and I think their, their legal explanation was, well, we're not mandated to do it, so we'll choose, we'll choose for you that you're, you're not to do it. Um, it kind of came across a little, not necessarily the best choice, but... Um, so you're not responsible if the person goes out or contributes to that if they go out and kill somebody. Right. So or you, if they get lost or... Exactly. You're so, not responsible. Right. So if your patient ends up being the, the uh, what is it, the silver alert yes. that when you're driving down the freeway, yeah, you, that the state is not going to come after you or the medical board is not going to, or the nursing board or whatever is not going to, like, give you a public letter of reprimand as a result. Incredible. 
Yes. So it's and the and the VA particularly kind of said, well, they might, you can tell the patient about it, but you're not you're not to call or contact or do anything. So who are the people that are mandated? Well, we've got the uh, self-referral, which is that every so often you have to renew your driver's license, and there are medical questions on that. And so if you check the yes boxes to some of those things, that ends up kind of popping you over here into the DPS clerks group. Uh, there's the law enforcement folks, and the interesting thing is for some reason the concealed handgun and driver's license like correlate together with this, which is so I didn't put this in, this is actually just copied right out of the PDF. So I think it's kind of fascinating, but um, anyways, the uh, law enforcement is somebody that, that reports people, and so they have the ability, if they see driving or accidents, they have the ability to make reports to DPS, <coughs> and it's down here to the DPS clerks. Um, physicians who don't work for the VA and decide to report somebody have the ability to make a voluntary report to goes down here to the DPS clerks. Um, interestingly, the people that really, really have the strongest requirement is the DPS driver's license, uh, the people that work in the driver's license office. So if they see any kind of problems, or they observe or, or um, get information about a medical condition or see problems in the driving record, they're completely mandated to report that to their superior folks at, the, at DPS um, for evaluation. And I think it's one of these things of, I don't know if anyone's gotten a driver's license here recently, you probably did. You? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet. Okay. Well, there's, there's like, essentially one driver's license place for all of San Antonio. And it's like off of Heapner or something or another. It's this giant warehouse building where if, you know, if you find going to like a Walmart to be a little overwhelming, that that is essentially this. And I wonder if like some of the, you know, go to part, go to zone A, then go to zone B, and then, you know, go to window 12 or something, may actually be part of it to try to trip up our uh, older patients who are having problems with visual and spatial skills. This way of, if you get lost at DPS, hey, you're over here. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, then, and now also getting a driver's license, you have to bring like 12 forms of ID and like your water bill and all kinds of other stuff with you. And so, if you make mistakes in that, they may also kind of, get, kind of triage you over here. Um, so, so we get to the DPS clerks that are now screening and deciding what to do at that point. And what they're going to do is they're going to follow the code there. So they're going to look at that book and kind of go, is there anything that we're seeing here that might suggest they have one of these contraindications of driving? And if they get kind of anywhere close to a yes on that, they're then going to send these medical history forms to the uh, to the licensee. And I don't really think that they're that strict on that. I, I really do. You don't? No. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's probably some that follow the letter of the law, but there are those that are driving on the road. Right, and the, and the fact that we see those silver alerts all the time, yeah. it seems like it's always Houston. Yeah. It's always someplace in Houston. Now, they can certainly alerts. drive even without a driver's license, of course. Yes. But I think that there are people that I, I know of recently that really shouldn't have renewed their license, and they were allowed to. So. Right. Well, that was my last patient today. He had just gotten his license renewed. Mm -hmm. His family was like, they, they were kind of hoping that DPS was going to be the bad guy for him, and DPS didn't step up and didn't play the game they wanted. Mm -hmm. So, so that medical history form, the last box there, who, who completes that? Well, we'll, we'll get to oh, that okay. guy <laughs> in, in a couple of minutes. So now the question is, you're kind of saying, well, where do the family and the friends fit in here? You know, what, what is like, you know, the dog, so, you know, the one thing you have is switch to the VA, you can't call and report them, and so then it's like, well, who's going to call and report them? Well, you can actually have a family and friends fit. So, or if you have a neighbor, for example, who's older and you have concerns about their driving ability and you're kind of anxious about not wanting them to end up in your front yard or something, you have the ability to make a report yourself as well. And so the concerns of unsafe driving, you can basically submit in writing a concern about drivers who may have a medical condition that can affect their ability to safely operate a, medical, a motor vehicle. Um, it can be submitted anonymously to DPS. Um, and particularly, uh, what they want you to do in this anonymous letter is basically provide a detailed explanation of why the person's unsafe. And the key is avoid personalizing information because uh, the, 
person who you report can actually ask to see the letter. So you don't want to like put it on your personal stationery and report your neighbor, because then you'll get kind of a knock on the door some evening and won't be able to have a bone to pick with you at that point. But if you kind of put in, you know, I know Joe Smith, I see him driving around a lot, and you know, he's getting lost and I have concerns about him to be, you know, drive safely, then you can go ahead, you know, you can put that in writing and, and send it in. And they're uh, remarkably uh, you know, just about every mode, mode of communication possible. So you can mail it to them, you can fax it to them, and you can email it to them. So what happens next? And that was your question. So the medical forms get sent out. Um, so then they're going to end up back in your office at that point to fill out the forms. Now the great thing is, is in California, the forms will get sent out to the, so you report the patient, the forms will go out to the patient, and then the patient will come back to your office to fill out the forms, and the, and the bottom of the form says, this person is safe to drive, yes or no. And so it would be like, great, you know, I just kind of report this person for dementia, now they're back here, and they're kind of staring at me, and usually they brought a kid with that's annoyed too, and I, I have to like do this in an objective way. So Texas has done something that I think is kind of a clever way to do this. Now, that's assuming it all works correctly. But is that your involvement in completing the forms, but not in reaching any conclusions? And so what you do is you can. So the, the great thing about this is that you don't have to, re, you know, you don't have to reach a conclusion. Additionally, the patient doesn't send it back; you send it back. So the great thing is you can just get the forms, be like, oh, I'll fill them out and send them in for you, and just that can be kind of the end of it at that point. Um, and so you mail these things back in, and then what happens is this medical advisory board staff that then prepares the case for physicians that they retain to then do these evaluations. I don't think they actually see the patient in most cases, but they basically go through the forms and other data that they have, and then use that to make a decision. And so what happens is they go and they, they review these cases, they write an opinion, and then this gets sent to DPS, and then DPS makes a decision about what to do with this time. So if they saw something where they're concerned about vision, maybe they'll make you go and get more detailed vision testing, for example, or if there are things that they clearly are violating, you know, your dementia is too severe, your heart disease is too severe, then they'll make a decision at that point about, you know, whether you're safe to drive and whether you should have a driver's license or not. So the nice thing is that as a kind of primary care provider, you kind of exit the process at this point and kind of the things that the patient's most anxious about kind of head off to other people at that point who don't have this conflict of interest. At the same time, you know, we want to be able to make up our own mind, you know, about our patient in terms of, you know, how are we going to counsel them and how are we going to counsel their family members. And so what I think is what we want to do is go back to our requirements for the safe driver, which is, you know, they need to have good vision, they need to have visual spatial ability, they need to know the car controls, they need to know the rules of the road, they need to have some flexibility, be attentive, decisive, quick reflexes, um, have a lack of distractions, and have some mobile hearing. So we can think about our patients in this light and kind of say, okay, what do we think they fit in? So kind of the, the steps I think with this is, first of all, based on their medical history, you want to see do they have a clear contraindication. You know, if, they're, if they're very demented, you kind of know at that point, no matter how well they do in the other things, they're just not going to be safe. They don't have the cognitive capabilities anymore. Similarly, if you have a patient that you know, has very, very poor vision, again, you're going to get into the whole thing of if they have a clear contraindication and you're not going to want to recommend, recommend continue driving for them. The next thing is, are there patient, family, friends, concerns that you want to be attentive to? And we know that that's a strong risk factor for the risk of crash. And so if there's a lot of, if there's a lot of folks kind of expressing significant concerns, it, we may, you know, even in the absence of clear contraindication, have you know, enough data there to really suggest, you know, I think it's kind of dangerous for you to continue driving because of, you know, whatever reason they're given. Um, the next one is to think about is, does it have a medical issue that would either be a distraction or somehow impair their intention? This kind of gets back to like, you know, do they have angina, do they have other, some other uncontrolled symptom? Do they have a lot of coughing, for example, and they might just get into a coughing fit while they're driving and not be able to drive safely at that point. Does the person have at some hearing and, and adequate vision? And this is one where referring them on to ophthalmology can be really helpful in terms of finding out like, you know, what is their vision really like? Do they have a lot of scotomas, for example? Do they have bad age-related macular degeneration and they're actually going to get referred to low vision or something like that? 
um, that while the person seemed normal in the office, it, it, when you really do confrontational testing, the deficits pop out. Um, does the person seem to have adequate flexibility? Meaning, like, you know, can they actually rotate? And, you know, my first patient today, I think, has Parkinson's disease, and he's telling me I can't, he can't roll over in bed anymore <coughs> because he's got such action of muscles. Richard, that's something like, if you can't roll over in bed, you probably can't, like, get into those blind spots. Um, and then, do you have concerns about the processing speed or reaction time? This is often like your Parkinson's patient or other folks that, for whatever reason, are just incredibly slow or really depressed or something, where you're just kind of anxious about whether they're going to be able to make this, the decisions they need to build drives. So, what do you do if you're if you're recommending to your senior that they don't drive? And so, I think the first thing is really appreciate you know that this is very devastating. To them. So, think about how happy you were when you were in high school or after when you got your driver's license, like you know, it, it, I can remember that like, you know, you'd, you'd always know your friend got their driver's license. They'd be kind of skipping down the hall in school or something like that, and uh, and then just imagine like you know the opposite of that, where they've lost the license, and how this is a blow to their ego. It's a risk factor of depression. They've lost the freedom. They've also lost a lot of their social interaction. Um, and then many communities, so like you lose your driver's license in Manhattan, for example, where I used to live, probably not a big deal. I mean, I lived in Manhattan for eight years and didn't have a car and didn't really want a car because it would just be more of a headache. Because um, you could get every place either on foot or by public transportation or a cab. But you know, if you live in a lot of parts of San Antonio, it's not being able to drive is a big problem. You're, you're kind of stuck at that point. Um, and so I think the one key is really want to feel, you want to either um, be prepared ahead of time or talk with family or something to help with help the patient brainstorm for other options to the whole, you know, so that when they stop driving, how are they going to be able to do the things they need to do? Um, and so kind of the things are, and this is just where it gets very tricky, and there's kind of it's hard to come up with a cookie cutter approach to this. Every patient and every family is a little different. Um, so are there friends, family, or neighbors <coughs> in the church that can provide rides? In Pittsburgh, you used to have these streets where, like, the entire street was related to each other, and so, like, you know, this, if Ma, you know, Nan and I couldn't drive anymore, there was like, you know, the better part of 20 other people that could take them someplace, um, and so it wasn't a big deal. Whereas, you know, there are a lot of in California, where I'm from, there are a lot of places where, like, the senior lives alone, son or daughter, for economic reasons, may live like an hour out of town, for example, and then it's a big problem at that point if mom or dad can drive anymore. Is public transportation an option? And surprisingly, even San Antonio has some areas of town that really a lot of bus service. I mean, I actually can walk to a bus stop from my from my house, and that bus could actually take me a lot of different places. Um, not all the areas of San Antonio are like that. Um, additionally, the city of San Antonio has a service where they offer rides to either medical appointments or to senior city and senior centers. Um, and this is something you can access off the city website, so at least you can offer. You know, they're not going to get shut out of medical care or being able to socialize or get lunch as a result of not driving. Um, there's also the VIA <coughs> program where you can get paratransit, uh, the things like Meals on Meals. It can be a way of getting meals to the person at least. And I think the other thing is sometimes this kind of leads into, um, not, not necessarily on the same day, but kind of a, a consideration on both the patient, the family, and perhaps your part of, like, is, is this maybe a trigger that starting to think about you know, different living situations might be you know, an important next step for, for that person. So at this point I'll sum up and take any questions. Um, so the things we've talked about today is older drivers can often drive, but they are at higher risk of accidents than other adults. Um, what we want to do is consider the requirements for safe driving as a way to help us evaluate whether our patient might be someone who's safe to drive or has limitations. Um, ultimately, in the state of Texas, only DPS and the Medical Advisory Board can involuntarily probe driving privileges, which I think is actually a smart, and, uh, at least something that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable in terms of not getting stuck in the middle of this. Um, and then additionally, there are other options that can be available to get to social events and shopping that are available out there just with a little bit of creative brainstorming. So at this point, I'll stop taking questions. Any questions? Any questions at all? Well, I'm kind of interested. I'm going to take a quick poll, a quick survey. Who here has been in a car accident? 
Who of those people who have been in a car accident, was the person who hit you much older and or at work much older, younger than you? About the same. About the same age? Same age? Same. Same age? Okay. Your statistics are. <laughs> well, I was involved in a car accident and it was a woman who was much younger. She was uh, in her early 20s on her cell phone. So I just wanted to know right. what the deal so, was. So you got the, uh, the 16 the, Yeah, I got that. That's that far in there. Yeah. Yeah. And we also wonder with the cell, the advent of the cell phone, like, you know, has that curve changed a little bit? Now? Yeah, it probably makes it much higher. It, yeah, yeah, is that, that, that left hand tail side and especially the texting. Hey, look, the Facebook update. Yeah. I came late, so did you mention that here at the VA they have the driving email? Ah, I did not. So yeah. that is, yeah. So there is a clinic and it's near the spinal cord area. And there's one lady that's been there for years. I don't have her name off the top of my head, but you can put a console through it if you came in R. Right, and exactly. And she'll do the, uh, so if there's a question of, about the safety of the patient, you send her, send, she'll evaluate them and she has like this, um, program, it's kind of like a video game that they actually drive, it's like a simulation. Right. And then she'll even go out with them and she she watches them drive. And she'll be the passenger, she has a brake on her side. Right, so you get out of control yeah. and stop the car. So she, she'll help determine if he should continue, if the vet should continue driving. Right. She it's real helpful. Report. She gives you a full report. So I'm not allowed to report on the state, but at least for the patient and the family, then because a lot of times it's kind of the family that's very invested in knowing about this. Yeah. Which, you know, understandably so. And the the Pittsburgh Police VA we had a driving clinic that I was pretty involved in, and they um, a combination of the geriatrician, um, a psychologist who did the full cognitive testing, an occupational therapist that did a lot of the physical functioning testing, um, and uh, then a social worker to help come up with other ideas for how to get them to drive. And then we'd send them off to simulators after that if they, if it was still very questionable. But it was kind of interesting seeing the different perspectives, and it was again a way to offload the burden from the primary care providers because it was a mandatory reporting state in Pennsylvania. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.